us started. Um, just in a ways of announcements, uh, we have a senior adult Bible study and lunch at, a, at 11 uh, o'clock on Tuesday. And guys, we're coming down to a close. This is like the next to the last one for the summer. And so, so senior adults, make sure you come out to that. And then they got the Cameron Club, that camera, camera club uh, in the youth room at 6 o'clock on, on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, just notice all the things that we got going on there. We're back in the winter Bible study. Uh, we were trying to uh, get through uh, Deuteronomy uh, over the next few weeks. And then we'll be at the Justice Center at 6 o'clock uh, on uh, Friday. And so if you get a chance to come out to be with us, we'd love to, love to have you come out to that ministry. And if not, uh, pray for them. And, and as we go in there, and, and that God would speak to the, the men and women there at the Justice Center. And then next week is fellowship dinner. So just put that on your calendar and don't forget that. And tonight, I just I think we're going to open in prayer. Uh, Connie just gave me a, um, a prayer request. Uh, Jacob Simpson, uh, he's stationed at uh, Fort Benning in Georgia. Uh, he's a friend of a Christian, uh, Christian Pickett. And uh, he was in an accident. And they airlifted uh, to the hospital in Macon, Georgia. And so I uh, just pray for them. I think... Um, there were some other soldiers also in that accident, and so, so we just need to pray uh, for them. And I'm going to ask B.W., since he's still up and shaking hands and came here. Just, a severe hand injury. Okay. A hand injury. Okay. 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 He is almost ready. He still hadn't heard a word that I said. <laughs> BW, okay, we want you to open us in prayer and pray especially, especially for Jacob Simpson and uh, there's an accident for some soldiers and just pray for all of them. And he said that, Jennifer said it was a severe hand injury uh, uh, that he has. So, and then just pray for our service tonight, okay? Amen. The Bible says that whenever you get saved, that God puts a new song in your heart. And that's why we sing, because he said, I put that there. He's created us to be musical beings. So would you stand up and sing one of my favorite hymns, He Keeps Me Singing. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the stars. Sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 this name I know fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Are you glad you're here tonight? The Bible says that uh, 
He is holy. He is God Almighty. And he says to raise up holy hands, righteous hands, holy hands to him in your praise and in your worship. This song says we stand and lift up holy hands. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. We stand and lift up our hands. Joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Holy, you up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing everyone sing holy is the Lord that chorus again. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His. It's rising up. It's rising up. Oh. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. It's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. And together we sing. And together we sing. Everyone. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And God, you are Lord. You're high above the earth. You're exalted above all other gods, and I exalt thee. I exalt thee, O Lord. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt. Oh. 
Lord, be glorified. In my song, Lord, be glorified. In your church, Lord, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified in my life, Lord, be glorified today. In my song, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my song. Yes. 
Amen. Thank you, Vicki and Alyssa. You know, is that your testimony tonight? If you know Jesus Christ, it should be your testimony. And it's well with your soul. No matter what you may be facing, you know, this week or this year, it's well with your soul because Jesus Christ is there with you. If you would take your Bibles, let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. And guys, guess what? I did remember what I'm going to preach on tonight. So that's wonderful. And uh, before I begin, though, um, uh, it's, it actually the topic is encouraging one another. And so uh, I just going to thought, well, let's just give a time of testimony. Would anyone like to give a testimony of how perhaps someone encouraged you uh, uh, in the Lord, uh, brother or sister? That did it. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Pete. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Anyone else got a word of encouragement or uh, for us tonight? The world doesn't have that hope, do they? But uh, that we have that wonderful hope in Jesus. He's good all the time. He's gone away and prepared a place for us. He's coming back and take us to, to, to himself one day, and uh, it's just going to be awesome. He will not disappoint us. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Anyone else got a word, testimony? Okay. If not, we're in Philippians chapter 1, as I said, and we'll continue our study of just Christian community. And I really pray that the, these messages are impacting our lives personally and also us as a church family, uh, that we just realize how much we need one another. We've talked about how important it is for us to love one another in actions and sacrificially. We talked about forgiving one another as uh, Christ has forgiven us. 
We talked about serving one another. That, you know, we're not here in this church to be served, but we're here to be servants. Uh, last week we talked about the submitting to one another. And we're to choose to be humble. Uh, we're to make ourselves accountable to one another. And this week's message is awesome and I hope encouraging for uh, we are talking about encouraging one another. And so let's stand. I just want to let's just begin by reading these verses tonight. And uh, I'm telling you, you're going to just be blessed just coming to hear these verses read tonight because they're just uh, just very encouraging. Uh, Paul begins there in verse three. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in my prayer of mind for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in so much as both in my bonds and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace, or you partner with me. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ for the love of Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That you may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense to tell uh, till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by uh, Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of our God. In them encouraging words, in them wonderful words. And we want to take that to heart today. You may be seated. I'm going to just pray for the message just a little bit later. You know, sadly, uh, not every, everything people say to us is encouraging. And even people who uh, we know that love us and love the Lord sometimes can say hurtful things. Uh, they can cause pain when they could have said something in a, in a more loving way that could encourage us instead of hurting us. Encouragement is, a, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. We all know people that uh, when we uh, speak to them, we're encouraged. And we love being around those type of peoples. And there's a lot of that type of people within our church because, you know, you're around them, you're encouraged, and you walk away joyful. But even though we may not have the gift of encouragement, we're all called, we're all commanded to encourage one another. Encouragement will flow from us uh, when we are renewed in the truth of the Scripture, when we're anchored in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it isn't uh, just giving superficial platitudes like, you know, it's all going to be good. You know, time heals all things. You need to get kind of over that. It's not just giving people empty promises or, or foolish statements, but give them the truth. We're giving them the hope that rules within our own hearts uh, through Jesus Christ. You know, life and relationships with other sinful, you know, brothers and sisters can be challenging to say the least. And so we need to encourage one another on a daily basis. Uh, Hebrews uh, 3 Verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of, of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another, encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And that's just telling us that we need to encourage one another. That God put the ball in our courts to get, it, to get this done between each other. We need people around us who will not allow us, you know, to walk in the direction of sin. Who will encourage us, to, you know, to walk in, in step with the Holy Spirit. We need people who will raise the bar when we want to lower the bar. Uh, Proverbs 27, 5 says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. And so to admonish and rebuke and encourage is, is, a lo is love in action. It's, it's growing together in Christ so that we can encourage one another on a regular basis. Now, with that said, I'm going to ask Chuck, won't you stand and just pray for this message on encouragement tonight? Amen. Amen. Well, first, just notice encouraging Christians are filled with joy. 
know, the whole book of Philippians is about joy and rejoicing. Uh, Mark Twain was a, just a professional humorist whose lectures and writings made people all around the world, you know, laugh and forget about their problems just for a little while. But, you know, in private, he was a very broken and very sorrowful person. When his beloved uh, daughter, uh, Jean, died suddenly of an epileptic seizure, uh, Twain was so uh, ill and so broken up that he could not even attend the funeral. And he said to a friend, he said, I have never greatly envied anyone but the dead. I always envy the dead. You know, on the other hand, Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, the Bible tells us. Yet he is, uh, possessed a deep joy that was beyond anything that this world could offer. As Jesus faced the, you know, the cruel death of Calvary, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. That if you've trusted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, uh, you have the privilege to experience the fullness of Christ's joy within your life. Are you taking advantage of that wonderful privilege? You know, if you're not, what is robbing you of that joy? There was a, no uh, earthly reason, you know, for Paul here uh, to be rejoicing when he wrote the book of Philippians. Here he's a Roman prisoner. He's about to be beheaded, possibly. He was in chains to the Roman guard. He could not preach the gospel in public as he desired to. The believers at Rome were kind of divided about Paul. You know, some was for him, but others was against him. So that made, you know, things even more difficult for him. But in spite of, of the dangers of discom uh, and discomfort and disloyalty, Paul overflowed with joy. And he writes just a wonderful letter to uh, encourage God's people. Because joyful people uh, will uh, encourage other people. You know, when we talk about Christian joy... You know, I'll give you this definition often, but it's so wonderful. We need to get this within our hearts. That super, uh, it's a supernatural uh, delight in the pe people and the purposes and, and the person of God. You know, let's see, kind of break that down as we begin tonight. First, joy is a supernatural. We cannot make ourselves joyful. It comes from God. It's a joy of the Lord. And when I uh, uh, was saved, God gave me a supernatural, unexplainable joy. Listen, has that happened in your life? You know, I'll tease B.W., you know, he's always saying all the time, you know, I'm the happiest person in the world in serving Christ. And our first thought may be it's because, you know, he's retired. That would be a good reason to be happy. Or he married Judy, which is wonderful. That's a good reason to be happy. Or maybe he just ain't got enough sense not to be happy. You know, we could think of that too. But listen, the truth is it was part of the salvation package that we've been given joy supernaturally in church. Let's take encouragement from that tonight. Amen. And in second, joy is a supernatural light in the person of Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why some Christians are more joyful than other Christians, perhaps more joyful than you? Perhaps they are focusing on Jesus more than what you're focusing on Jesus. Joy is a person. It's not a thing. We're to be encouraged in Jesus Christ. And then third, joy is a supernatural light in the purposes of God. God has great purposes for us individually. He has a great purpose for this church. Folks, it's exciting to be a part of his plan. It's exciting to be a part of his purpose. And it brings us great delight in knowing that God uses us to reach his world for Christ. And that's, that's encouraging. And then last, joy is just a supernatural delight in the people of God. You know, I often say, I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. If you don't get that thrill, if you don't get that joy of coming to church and just d doing missions together and working for God, uh, with God's people, listen, there's something wrong within your life. You're focusing your life on the wrong things. If you have joy in the people of God, then you will naturally want to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. Joyful Christians are encouragers. Now, second notice, encouraging Christians a fellowship with others. Look at verses 3 through 5 again. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Man, aren't they just wonderful words? Isn't that a wonderful prayer? Paul was thinking of others and not of himself. Paul is waiting to be on trial here as he, he thinks about the Philippian believers. And it brings him joy. Listen, in Philippi, Paul had been illegally arrested and beaten. He'd been placed in stocks. He was humiliated before the people. But even in those memories, even in those sacrifices for the gospel, it brought him joy. It was through Paul's suffering that, you know, the Philippian Jerilo found Christ in his family. 
Paul recalled, you know, Lydia and her household and, and the poor slave girl that had been demon-possessed had been delivered. You know, the other uh, uh, dear Christians in, in Philippi. He'd been, he'd been an encouragement to each of them. In each memory, it brought him joy. You know, when people think about you, do you bring them joy? When people think of your name, does a smile come to their face? If not, you need to be striving to be that person. There's something wrong with your confession. Paul's saying it was a joy to pray for them. Verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. Paul's saying, I'm always praying for you. And every time, it brings me joy when I think about you. When I think about what we did within the ministry together. Paul wasn't wasting him time in prison here. He was constantly, he was frequently praying for his brothers and sisters in Christ. And why was, was this prayer giving him joy? Because of some successful, you know, business adventure that they had together. Was it because Paul was excited to tell them you know, how great and you know, perfect his life was in Christ? That he was healthy and wealthy and prosperous? No. Why did Paul find such joy within this church? Look at verse 5. It's for your fellowship. It's for your partnership. Fellowship, you know, often is misunderstood in our day. And we think that fellowship is kind of hanging out together. You know, let's have a party. Let's, let's have some fellowship. But true Christian fellowship is much, much deeper than even just friendship. It's more than eating a meal together. It's more than going golfing or playing tennis together. Fellowship is even more than just, you know, being a member of this church. Because some of you have been a member of this church for a long time. And yet you've not entered into fellowship with those in this church. We need to know what real fellowship is because it, that's what brings us joy. It is in fellowship that we, we are to encourage one another. Listen, fellowship is not just friendship. It's not just hanging out with other people. That word fellowship actually means the sharing of life together. Man, I love Acts 2.42. It says, the believers there continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, uh, in fellowship, and in prayer. You know, we're talking on Sunday nights here about, the, about what it means to be a Christian community. What it means to be a church. Listen, that's the four key ingredients. You know, if we want to be a healthy church, we're teaching God's word. We're exalting it and we're uplifting, you know, Jesus Christ. And it's taking the Lord's Supper together. It's praying together. And, and it's fellowship as we encourage one another in that fellowship. You know, a lot of churches, they can do a good job with the preaching and teaching part and observing the Lord's Supper and even prayer, yet they've not really entered into true Christian fellowship. Yet a church cannot strive, uh, thrive with, without fellowship. You cannot know the joy that God wants to give you and fill your life with, you know, that you was given when you was born again, without fellowship. You cannot be an encourager without fellowship. That's what brings unity. That gives us agreement brought by the Spirit of God, surrounded by the work of God. Notice he says, for your fellowship in the gospel. There it is. This is important for, it, it's the reason, you know, some of you are probably always searching. It's the reason that some even say that they're Christian, but they're never satisfied. They're always wanting more out of life. They just don't get this right here. We don't get together and interact or work on some random thing. Our fellowship and our partnership is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is not longing for these people because they had, you know, great fellowship dinners or, you know, they gave a shower for their sister in the fellowship hall. Listen, that stuff is good and we need to do some of that stuff. But true fellowship is the gospel. That's the best thing that we can be involved in. That's what brings us the real joy. It's two people in, in a harness together. It's plowing together. It's sharing the gospel. It's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, you know, died for our sins. He buried, but he rose again on the third day. He's coming back one day in glory and in victory. And because of the work of Christ. You know, coming into the world to, to save sinners. We don't have to die. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, to whom believes him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, do you believe that Jesus died for you? Oh, do you believe tonight by turning from your sin and, and embracing Christ by faith, you can be forgiven, that you're given eternal life? Folks, that's the good news. That's what we're to be proclaiming to our world. 
And if you want to turn up the joy within your life, a partnership with this church in spreading the gospel. Jesus is sending people free. He's forgiving sins. He cleanses our life, which brings us joy. We're to partnership together in the gospel. Man, that fires up our family. That fires up our marriage. That will fire up our church. Genuine fellowship involves the truth. It involves the gospel. You know, real fellowship is, you know, going on a mission trip, perhaps to Honduras and, and building our ministry and proclaiming the gospel to the, the kids there in that orphanage that Christ died for. You know, real fellowship is, you know, going perhaps to Mexico or other places that we've gone in within this church or, you know, out west to, the, uh, uh, to Oklahoma to, uh, to, to pass out Bibles or to give gifts and, and proclaim the gospel to those people that Christ died for. You know, it's going to Canada to, to work and, and to minister there and, and to share the gospel with the kids that come to the camp of the woods. Real fellowship is all the ministry we get, we, we've got going for the purpose of sharing the gospel. It's working on, 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 on proclaiming uh, 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 so, uh, uh, so that we can share the gospel with our world. That if you are visiting and, and you kind of wonder why there's so much joy and there's so much laughter when you come to this church, it's because there's so much, I think, real fellowship that goes on here. That, that the focus is upon Jesus Christ. We want more than anything else to share the gospel with the whole world. Amen. We want any, more than anything else to share the gospel with the community that God placed us in. And in, in, in it, we're encouraging one another. You know, it's true fellowship when people uh, comes back from a mission trip and, man, they just think, man, you need to get plugged into this. Man, that's what brings real joy. Vacation is good, but it don't hold a light to what it means to working together to proclaim the gospel to our world. That's where the joy is at. From fellowship and, and you experience the, uh, the, uh, of uniting with a group of people and working for the Lord and proclaiming Him. Now listen, let me just encourage you tonight, if you're sitting on the sidelines, get up and get in the game. Because that's where the real joy is. Encouraging Christians are fellowshipping with others. And then third, just notice, encouraging Christians are growing in the Lord. And I love verse 6. This is fantastic. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, people often start things and, and they, they drop them. But folks, God never, get, never, never starts anything that he doesn't finish. Amen. God sees it through to the end. Our confidence in salvation, my confidence in my sanctification, my confidence in my security is not in ourselves. Listen, it is in God. Paul says, I'm sure that God who began a good work in you will bring it to the day, uh, bring it, uh, it to completion the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, God finishes what he starts. And if he saved you, he will keep you saved. If he saved you, he's going to keep you growing. If he saved you, he's going to mature you until the day that he comes back or until the day that he calls you home. Well, let's encourage each other with that truth tonight. It brought Paul joy that he knew that God was still working in the lives of his fellow believers there in Philippi. Be assured, church, be confident. God doesn't lay hands on a person's life for just like 15 minutes. He doesn't lay hands in your life for just like 15 years. It's a lifetime and then going beyond into eternity. Man, we need to be excited. This is mountain peak verse here tonight, folks. This is comforting verse. We can be sure that he who began a good work in us, he will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He began it. He will complete it. We call that the doctrine of eternal security. You know, that can be highly debated in some Christian circles. Uh, that's the eternal security means when a person, you know, comes to the Lord Jesus personally, uh, comes to Jesus personally, that, that that relationship can never be changed. That relationship can never be taken away. It's a permanent thing. Eternal life is eternal. We become the child of God. We're a permanent child of our heavenly Father. Our God's not an ending giver. He doesn't give us a gift in eternal life and ask it back, you know, at some point within our lives. You know, the, the Lord said through Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In 2 Corinthians 4, let me just read a little bit there in verse 8 and 9. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 
uh, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with him. And it sounds like those folks, that they were feeling pretty secure in Christ. You know, the Bible compares Christians to you know, trees that do not wither. Uh, cedars of leaven that flourish from year to year. Kind of like the giant uh, redwoods in California. Christians are like houses that are built upon the rock. Or Mount Zion that, that uh, cannot be moved. I love John 10. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone take them out of my hands. My Father who is greater than all has given them to me. And no one can take them out of the Father's hand. Folks, that's encouraging tonight. That's beautiful. Do you think anything in this world can change that? Folks, nothing uh, can change that it's permanent. It's an eternal relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. You say, but Brian, what if someone who claims to be a Christian goes out and willfully sins in some way? You know, what if sin becomes a pattern in their life? Well, let me ask you a question tonight. Don't you think God our Father is big enough and smart enough to know how to handle one of his rebellious children? He knows how to discipline his true child and bring them back into line. It breaks my heart that many Christians can't enjoy this beautiful truth of eternal security because they're worrying about so-and-so. If they're getting away with this sin, they're doing this, and, and then they can't enjoy what God has given them. We sound like a bunch of Pharisees with questions like, oh, do you think Bill is saved? You know, he's become an alcoholic and he's always running around with his wife and he beats his children. You know, he prayed that sinner's prayer when he's six years old. He's not been back in church, you know, since then. Well, duh, what do you think? He says, by the truth, by their fruit, you will know him. He didn't lose his salvation. He never had it to begin with. And he certainly is not going to cause me to lose my security. For I get it when I was saved. And I will not let anybody steal the joy that comes through the security I have in God. And I'm God's forever. Uh, and it, it brings him glory. It brings him honor when we proclaim that. He's my loving father. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. God doesn't have any children he orphans. He may have a, to discipline us. It may come so extreme that he says that, that a rebellious child, that he had to give over to Satan to destroy the flesh, but, but his soul would be secure in Christ. He that began a good work in us will bring it to completion. Amen. If it's begun, he's going to finish it. He never abandons his plans. He never begins at work that he doesn't finish. You know, Romans um, 8, 29 through 30 is good. For whom did he foreknow? Uh, for no, he also did predestinate to be uh, conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many children. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, uh, then he also called. To whom he called, them also justified. To him he justified, then he also glorified. It's the, he takes us from, from the beginning to the end. There will be no one in heaven, you know, uh, boasting anything that they have done. What we get, folks, we boast in Jesus Christ and him alone. So if you don't believe God will keep you secure, in, in reality, you're just kind of boasting in your own good works. Well, maybe I can be good enough to get to heaven. You know, maybe I can be moral enough. Maybe my commitment will be strong enough. No, it, well, it's in Jesus Christ and Christ alone that we're secure. Amen. And, and we get our salvation. If a person knows Christ as their Savior, they don't look at salvation, you know, as fire insurance. So now we can just go live any way that we want. Man, we, are, we have a new spirit within us. He says we become a new creation in Christ. Now, you know, when we fail, God, it, it hurts. Uh, it just kind of rips our hearts out when we fail our Lord. So God keeps his own. So the question that you need to ask tonight is uh, for, for assurance of salvation is not does God keep his own, but am I, am I his own? And if you are, uh, be encouraged tonight. John said, I've written these things that, so that you may know that you're saved. Matthew said again, by their fruits you will know them. Um, by the fruits of the Spirit. Are you changing? Are you growing in your love? 
by your love for one another. The world will know that you're my disciples. Folks, if the world can know there's a difference, the world knows we're his disciples. Why would we doubt if we was his disciples or not? If the people you, you work with, though, do not consider you to be a Christian, if they're surprised when they find out you go to the church, this is a good indication you're playing games with God. You really don't know God. Are you growing in joy and peace? Are you growing in your faith and self-control? The humility, the patience, the godly character, that's the fruits of the Spirit. And these fruits are evidence that we have been born again. You know, are you fired up about being a part of his church, the Christian community that we've been talking about? Are you growing in the one another statements that we've been studying? Are you growing in the way that you're loving one another, forgiving one another, serving one another, submitting to one another, encouraging one another? You know, God is determined to do a good work in us, uh, the work to conform us into the very likeness and the character of his son. You know, God the Father is so delighted with his son. He has called millions of sinners to himself in order that Jesus' life can be reproduced in us. That the church is to be repopulating this world with millions of Christ-like followers. That's what life is to be about. That they can see Christ's love in us and his goodness and mercy. They can see his holiness in, in, in us. So how crazy is it when, when we try to, you know, to kind of run our own lives or kind of pick our own goals or choose our own purposes? We're here to do his purpose. And his purpose, he says in Romans, it's a good purpose. It's a good plan. It's an excellent plan. It's a perfect plan. Oh, so learn to rely upon him. Grow in grace as, we, as, he, as he molds you into the very image of his wonderful son. As he works in you to, to accomplish his will and his purposes in our world. He says again in verse 6. That he which has begun a good work in you uh, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. As an encouraging Christians are growing in the Lord. And in fourth just notice encouraging Christians are tender. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, even as it is meet for me to think of, of this of, uh, of you all, because I have you in my heart, and so much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels or the love of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a very tender thing to say? Paul said, listen, I love you. You're in my heart. If you're looking uh, for encouraging relationship, there, there's no place to find that, you know, outside the body of Christ. People who will love you through thick and thin. People who will stick with you with all of your imperfections. If you will get involved in the real work and true fellowship, a byproduct of it is that tenderness. It's a joyful relationship that we have with the people of God. You know, can I truly say I, I really enjoy, you know, being with my brothers and sisters in Christ within the church? You know, as a pastor, God may call me some way, uh, sometime away from this church, but I can truly say I love you guys, and, and you have become my family. You've become my joy. You're in my heart. You've encouraged me, and I hope I'm an encouragement to you in your walk with Christ. Amen. Oh, Christian love is the tie that binds, and, and love is the, is the very essence of our salvation. First uh, John 3, 14 says, We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. I said, how do I know I'm really saved? It's because I love you. How do you know if you're really saved? Because you love me. Because you love your brothers and sisters sitting in these pews tonight. How did Paul show his love, you know, to his brothers and sisters? Listen, he was suffering on their behalf. He was in prison. Uh, he was in bond because of his love for them. He was a prisoner for Jesus Christ for them. Paul did not merely talk about love, but he practiced that love. Paul longed for his friends in the, he says, in the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, when we permit God to perform his good work in us, then we grow in our love for one another. We grow in that tenderness towards one another. Uh, our concern is for our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 John 3, 18, My little children, let us not love in, in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
So when, we go, when you go visit someone, say, in the hospital, that's showing your love for them. Maybe when you, you go to, you know, be with that family when they lose someone at a funeral home. Or you go to that wedding and someone gets married within our church. When you go out and visit, when you try to help and you give something to, uh, to help someone. When you send that card, uh, when you take the time to talk to someone that, that's discouraged. Listen, that's showing your concern. That's showing your love for them. That shows it. Listen, they're in your heart. Isn't that, have you thought about that? Do you think about these people within this church that you're doing life, that they're in your heart. These are the people that you've chosen to love and, 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 to, and to reach the world with the gospel. It's encouraging one another. Paul felt the Philippian church with, with, with him, with him when, when he was presenting the gospel and they prayed for him and they stood for them when he was in prison here. Tenderness comes from being an encourager. And then last, just notice here, encouraging Christians are, are transformed. Look at verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Paul prayed that they would be more loving. That their love would abound yet more and more. Listen, are you more loving person than you were last year? Are you more loving person than you was at the beginning of this new year? Now we're, you know, going in my third month. Are you a more loving person to your spouse? Are you a more loving person to your family, to the people within this? Listen, is God doing a work of love within your life? He says, I want you to grow in love. And as a pastor, I want us to grow in love for one another. That's a prayer for maturity. And Paul begins here with love. If love is what it should be, everything else falls into place. We're transformed through the love of Christ. And so Paul says, I want you to be abounding in love. I want you to have a discerning love. Our love isn't blind. We, we need to discern right from wrong. Listen, that's what maturity is. And in second, Paul prayed that they would make better decisions. Look at verse 10. That you may approve things that are excellent, that, that you may be sincere without offense till, uh, till the day of Christ. So he says, you know, you, you, I'm praying that you have more love and you make better decisions. Without love, we cannot discern what is best. Without love, we cannot discern what is pure and blameless. That we, that we would be sincere without offense. That word sincere means tested by the sunlight. A sincere Christian is, is not afraid to stand in the light. I like this statement. A biographer asked Charles Spurgeon one time if he could write his biography. And Spurgeon said, you may write my life in the clouds. I have nothing to hide Listen, church, I don't know. I want to be able to say that about my life to others. So Paul prayed that they would have mature uh, Christian love and character without offense, he says, until the day of Christ. So we're not to cause others to stumble. It should break our hearts if we allow sin back in our life. And someone might see that, that we would cause them to stumble in some way. We're to live a life that's pleasing to God and pleasing to others. A life that encourages others. You can live like me because I'm trying with all my heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm showing Christ's love and I'm doing these things that God's called me to do. You know, just live your life like, 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 like you see Christ's life being lived out in me. Oh, reflecting Christ's character to the world. Folks, that's what we're to be about. So he says that, you know, I'm praying that you have more love, abounding love, greater love for one another. I pray that you'll make better decisions and, and be fruitful and, and God and a, have a fruitful, God-honoring life. That's the last thing there in verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of our God. Listen, there's a lot of joy in fruit bearing. Oh, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of winning others to Jesus Christ. The fruit of praising God with our lips during worship. You know, John uh, 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Listen, our fruit brings glory to God. That's what we're living for. We're not to boast about our works, but we give the glory to Jesus Christ. Church, isn't it wonderful being a part of a Christian community where you're encouraged and you're encouraging others in the faith. 
Our focus is on others, not ourselves. And it takes hard work to be the church God called us to be. It takes hard work to be an authentic church. But folks, it's worth it all. This is just a little slice of, you know, heaven. This, this, is, the, this is as good as it gets in this life. So let's work at it. So, so as we, we go into uh, our, our invitation time as David comes, I pray that every one of our prayers would be, Father, let me be an encouraging, uh, encouragement to others. You know, God, let the gifts that you've given me be used to bless them in their lives. Lord, I want to speak grace into their lives. I want to, when they think of me, I want them to get a smile on their face. I want them to think of me with joy because I'm living for you and I'm encouraging them. Make me your ambassador to the hurting and lost within this community. Lord, we want our church to be known for caring for sinful people and despairing and hurting people. We want to point them to the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, may the people of our church care for one another. Uh, there would be no, never be a doubt that they know that we are the people of God. Amen. Amen. And we, may we be able to pray as Paul prayed here. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in my prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Amen. Won't we stand? Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this message today.